level two. Yes. Thank you very much. I would say nobody can give you a, a definite answer right now. Some people think that there is a, a, a real boundary. Uh, one of the things as an experimentalist, I like one of these ideas is that there's some physical process that we haven't clearly identified yet that, that for certain size systems will, will, will give rise to this boundary between the quantum world where we have superpositions and the classical world where we don't. Uh, but that's, I think, I think that's clearly just speculation. So, I, I, I personally think this is one of the, one of the big mysteries in, in science, as we don't, we don't have a way to resolve this problem. That is why, you know, we aren't in superpositions ourselves. And of course, extreme solution to that is well, we are in superpositions. I do many universes, many worlds. So, uh, I think one of the very interesting questions for the future is to resolve just this problem, the fact that we don't, we, we don't really have a way to define this boundary, and maybe there isn't one. Well, you know, money always helps. It's required <laughs> to, to fund the research we do, but uh, I, I think it'll be maybe a combination of that being able to do more sophisticated experiments, but it'll almost undoubtedly involve some clever thinking about how to how to view this problem. And and uh, but I, as I say, I think this one of the things that make this really interesting and this problem, to my mind and to many people's mind, is is unsolved right now. So. A good example is the laser. When the first lasers were made, nobody realized all the things that it would be used for. And I think very likely we're in the same situation with these ideas of quantum information or quantum computing is that, you know, we have this one killer application, this factoring machine, but but very almost, you know, very likely the, the, the real applications are ones we haven't thought of. And, but having said that, I think when, uh, on, on the shorter term, I think what most physicists and think about is this idea that, that it comes from Richard Feynman, one of the early people to think about quantum computers, is that maybe we can get one quantum system to, to mimic or simulate, we say, another quantum system of interest. And, and I think most of us are, are at least optimistic that, that, that we will find a a, a, a quantum simulator that not only we have small ones now, but it's, they're small enough now that we can simulate what goes on with a classical computer. And I think the, the, the exciting thing is that, that I think most of us are optimistic that at least maybe not in the too far future that we would get a, a simulator, a quantum simulator that will tell us something interesting that we didn't know before. And, and that will come, I think, at least from our understanding now, that will come way before a useful quantum computer is made. The fundamental particles, the gluons and, and quarks that, that make the elementary particles, and then those particles that combine together to, you know, these, these systems can't be simulated efficiency because of this problem of exponential scaling. So that would be, that's one area where people are thinking about. The other, another example might be in this, this is a little hard to see maybe now how this works, but for example, in, in, uh, as people make drugs, which are big molecules, maybe, uh, maybe a, a potential use of a, of a quantum computer might be able to simulate their behavior without having to make them, you know, to be able to predict their properties. But so, so it's, it's those kind of things which are, uh, you know, still yet to be realized, but I think are, are 
potentially real possibilities that that that, that might you know might really be a, a useful uh, application of, of quantum computers. There's various proposals, theories put forward that, for example, maybe the the uh, fundamental constants which which describe the strength of the various fundamental forces in nature, possibly they might be changing in time. And you know, there's no so far there's no overwhelming reason that should be the case. But with these very accurate clocks, we can actually test these ideas at ever increasing levels of precision. And if we found that to be a, the case, that would that would be a very fundamental discovery and would change how people formulate the you know the theories that concern the basic forces in nature on a much more practical scale uh, you know certainly clocks throughout history you know for many many centuries their main function has been for navigation and and uh, you know we kind of take for granted these days the ability to navigate sort of at on the meter level of precision with, uh, you know, with GPS. And, and that's one example where atomic clocks have been, uh, you know, important because they're used, they, you know, they're on board the satellites that, that, that are used in, in GPS. So uh, you could argue, well, we, if we can navigate to a meter, that's pretty good. But an example where even more precise navigation would be used. Uh, one, one popular example is that, uh, that you know, it, it, the pre more precise navigation could be used to measure displacements of position on the Earth, you know, on the millimeter level of precision, and that that potentially is very important. For example, as a as a predictor of earthquakes, the fact that the Earth will stretch or contract in locations uh, depending on you know the uh, before an earthquake happens, and so that would be one application that, that people look forward as we get better and better in terms of the clocks and their navigation abilities. It's almost surreal experiment or experience for us to receive the awards from the lab. No, as far as we know, no. So we, uh, it's a matter. There's some uh, when we compare clocks. There's certain fundamental noise processes that we say that 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 require us to uh, to compare the say the the clock rate the tick rates of different clocks we need to we need to compare them for longer units of time to to get high precision uh, but other than that this you know we say we're we're kind of averaging over the noise that that and there's some fundamental uh, sources of this noise uh, but other than that, having to maybe uh, average the, you know, the, the, or compare the clock, the, the rates of two clocks over longer and longer times, so we can always reach, in principle, arbitrary precision. So, so as far as we know, no, the answer is there shouldn't be any limit to how precisely we can, can, can make time or do these comparisons. I probably do take a very practical on the view on that. It just it's a way to order events in some logical way. And I don't I, I think anybody's notion of time is is probably as good as anybody any physicist's notion of time. It's just a way to order events in a in a logical way, and I think that's the way most of us feel, and most of us physicists, it, it has that same application for us too.